Uh, I think this microphone's a little loud for me. So, well, good morning. Uh, let me uh, open us in a word of prayer. We can get started. Our Father, we come to you this morning. We praise you that you are uh, our God, that you are, you've made yourself our Father. Uh, you have uh, adopted us into your family. Uh, you have uh, done everything for our salvation. You have spared no expense. You have given your only son. Um, you've given him to us. Uh, we thank you, Father, that we can gather together this morning as your people, as uh, redeemed, as uh, righteous in your sight. We thank you that we, we can seek your face in worship. We want to give you the praise and the honor that you deserve this morning. We want to uh, plead with you for your work in our hearts to uh, continue uh, your work to sanctify us, to make us over and over again more and more like your son Jesus. We pray forgiveness for the ways we still fall short of that. We pray that you would, would be helping us today um, to know you better, uh, to walk with you more closely, um, and especially as we consider uh, your revelation in the Old Testament, uh, that we would uh, learn to appreciate uh, the pictures of salvation that you've given us and of the love of Christ that has been working out in history uh, and has now come to fulfillment in the cross and the resurrection. We pray and ask in your name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Well, I think most everybody has been here, but we, just to remind you, we are talking about the subject of Christ in the Old Testament. We believe that all scripture is meant to be read as Christian scripture, is ultimately about Christ and points us to Christ. Even the Old Testament is meant to be read as Christian scripture with a Christ-centered interpretation. And so part of what we are doing in this class is, is really discussing, in some ways, the subject of hermeneutics. Um, if you're not familiar with that word, that's just a big theological word that means the principles of interpretation of the Bible. How we interpret the Bible is hermeneutics. Um, and uh, I wanted to begin this class with um, kind of a, a graphic or a model that I learned in seminary that I think is, is really helpful. And, and this was first kind of articulated by, by a theologian named Ed Clowney, who was the president of Westminster Seminary in the mid-20th century. And this has become known as, uh, as Clowney's hermeneutical grid. Um, I should have made some of those a little bit bigger. But basically what this grid is trying to give you is a, a process of thinking through really any passage of scripture to try to understand its meaning. And what you have there on, on the left, and you'll, you'll notice that they're a little small, but there are arrows. And on, on the left side of that rectangle, you have an arrow going from text to what I'm calling the original horizon. Um, and what that's basically trying to say is the first step to understand a passage of scripture is to ask and consider what, what a text meant to its original audience. Um, what it meant to the original people to whom it was written. Uh, and some people might call this the, the, the grammatical historical interpretation of the Bible. What did the words mean um, in the history in which it was originally given? Now, we, we know that there's limitations to that. Because um, Carson talked to you last week, and I talked to you several weeks ago about 1 Peter 1, verse 10, that talks about the prophets in the Old Testament didn't fully understand what the prophecies meant that God was giving them. And they, they realized at some point that, the, what, that they were actually serving us and that what they were writing wouldn't be fully understood 
until God brought his revelation to completion in Christ. Um, and so there, there's a limitation on, even in the Old Testament, what people could totally understand, but there was still a reason why God gave the prophecies when he did. And there was an original message that was meant to be understood by the original hearers. Um, and so if we just jumped from the original text to today, um, we're, we're, we're not doing justice to the Bible as it was originally written, all right? Um, so we need to understand any text in its original context. But if you just jumped from the original context to us, you actually are gonna miss some of the bigger picture of the Bible, and, and you risk just using the Bible to give moral lessons, if that makes sense. So you'll notice there's a, a dotted line going from the original horizon to the contemporary horizon, that's us. And if we just did that, we have the risk of just doing moralism, making the Bible into moral lessons. And so there's a second step and a second arrow that goes from the original horizon to the, what I'm calling the Christological horizon. And what that means is we wanna, we wanna take some time to consider a passage in light of the whole of God's revelation, the completion of God's revelation, and the whole canon of scripture to consider the theological context of a passage and where it fits in the whole of what God was doing in history. Um, and really ask how a passage is meant to be understood in light of Christ. And that's actually what we're talking most about in this class. And what we've been saying is that every passage of scripture anticipates, points to, or explains the work of Christ. All of God's promises, even in the Old Testament, are yes and amen in Christ. He is the central message of the Bible. And so to understand any passage of scripture, you need to understand what it originally meant to the audience it was given, to the extent that they could understand it. We need to then interpret it in light of the completion of God's revelation in Christ. And only when you go through those steps, then can you understand how a passage applies to us today, which is the, the third, the right side of the rectangle. Now, if you were to jump from just the text, this, the bottom line, if you were to jump from the text to the contemporary horizon, that's, that's what I would call the magic eight ball method of interpreting scripture. You, know, you remember the magic eight ball, you know, you'd ask a question, you know, um, does this, does this girl like me? You know, uh, most definitely not, you know, or something like that. You know, and, and sometimes people read the Bible like, okay, what is God's message for me today? When I restore your, uh, I will bring you in and restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. That's awesome. It's like, you know, it's like a, you know, fortune cookie. Um, and I read the Bible as, you know, like, that's God's message directly to me today. But I may not be really understanding the message that was meant. And so you can't just jump from the text to today. You've got to go through some steps. And those steps are you need to understand the, the original message to the original audience, the context, the, the historical context, you need to understand the theological context, where it fits in with the story of Christ, and only then does it begin to be something that we can understand and its relevance uh, to us. Um, now here's what's especially important for this class, because what we're focused on in this class is that, that top right side of the triangle, understanding how a passage relates to Christ, if you were to skip from the text straight to Christ, without considering the original context, 
that's where you get into the danger of allegorizing scripture. So you have that dotted line going from the text to the Christological horizon, and the danger there is that we're getting allegorical. And we're, try, we're trying to find some, some allegory that may not actually be originally meant in terms of what, it was, what was originally given. And so we're gonna be discussing today um, how we do some of that. And today, especially, we're gonna be talking about typology or pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. And what we're, what we're gonna have to say though is that the pictures we're gonna be looking for are not arbitrary. They have to grow out of what was originally meant. Um, so there's, there's a way to understand the tabernacle and the temple as a picture of Christ, but that grows out of what the tabernacle and temple originally meant. Um, you know, it, it would be a little harder to, to you know, like let's say you, you look in um, you know, Jesus' birth and the wise men giving him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And some people in history have said, well, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, you know, are pictures of, you know, different, you know, they're trying, they try to make them into like allegories of uh, symbols of things that we're supposed to give to, to God and symbolizing something. And yet it's not completely clear that that's what was originally meant. And so you're trying to make something mean something that's not a natural outgrowth of what it originally meant. All right. We'll come back to that. So to remind you what we've said so far, when you read the Old Testament, we are meant to see, or we, we can see Christ either prescribed, promised, pictured, or present. That's the model we're, we're using. Um, and so what we're saying is he is everywhere either anticipated as a solution to the problem, meaning any passage you could say there's a problem being addressed, sin, distance from God, and therefore Christ is the prescription, Christ is the solution being anticipated. He's either promised in prophecy, okay? That's what, what Carson's subject was last week and you talked in general about how to interpret prophecy and then ultimately how these prophecies are, are promises that that point us to Christ. He's pictured in typology or he's present in action and appearance. Um, so you know, when, Paul, when Carson talked to you last week, he talked to you and said prophecies can have multiple meanings. The big picture point is that you see Christ re re repeatedly promised in the Old Testament, not just in the technical prophets, prophetic books, but prophesied throughout the Old Testament, all right? So going back all the way to Genesis 3, 15, you have a promise that God makes. He will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Uh, he will crush your head, though you will bruise his heel. And God gives this promise of an offspring who will wage war and have victory over the serpent. So there's a prophecy that's a promise that God is going to give what he prescribes. Um, you see God's promise to Abraham that one of his offspring will possess the gate of his enemies and bless the whole earth. Uh, you have Moses telling the people God's promise that God would one day raise up a prophet like him from among their brothers, who would de deliver the people from slavery. You have God's promise to David that one of his servants, one of his, excuse me, one of his descendants would be God's forever king. And, and then you see those, some of those prophecies getting more and more specific. Um, you, you have prophetic psalms that give details about Christ's experience on the cross. Um, you have prophecies in Isaiah about a child who would be born, about a suffering servant who would be a light to the nations and bear 
God's people's sins. Um, and so these are the, are the ways Christ is promised and prophesied in the Old Testament. Now today our subject is Christ pictured. Um, and the technical word is typology. What, what is typology? I've already used the word picture, but how, how would you define typology? Study of type. All right, what is, what is a type? A this and not that, okay? This is the type of a thing, and that is not type of a thing. What else? Something Christ-like, or something that points to Christ. Okay. Something Christ-like, something that points to? Like individuals, I'm thinking. All right, we, it's, it's basically, typology is basically a symbol that represents something else. Um, something of greater importance. And so there's a, there's a type, and then there's uh, an anti-type, or some people say an archetype. Robin. I'm just wondering, what is the difference of that and allegory? Um, what I, the way I'm distinguishing right now is that is an allegory is, is usually uh, not something real. Um, Whereas these are things that we're gonna see that are real. They're real things, but they're types of something greater to come. There's a type and an anti-type, or you could say an archetype. And the anti-type is the greater thing, the greater reality that the type is picturing. As, as Peter said, this is a type of that. Um, or you could say this is a shadow of a greater reality. Um, so for instance, uh, Hebrews 8, verse five, says, uh, talk, talking about the priests in the Jerusalem temple, says they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent or the tabernacle, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. The, the word pattern there is the word tupos. It's where we get our word type. Um, everything, see that everything you make everything according to the type, the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Um, what, what that seems to be saying, and this is, this is, that's a little bit of a weird, weird stuff, but um, it's basically implying that there's architecture in heaven. You know, we, we, we don't always think about <clears throat> heaven as a place. We know it's not a physical place, but we don't know what other word to use. There's some substance there. There's location there. There are beings there. You know, God transcends the heavens, but he is in the heavens. He dwells in heaven, and there are other beings there, and there seems to be things that go on there. We know that Christ, as the resurrected human, is there. Um, and there's a, there's a heavenly reality that, the tabernacle in the temple was picturing as a type. And so, when you, in that sense, typology is not just talking about pictures of Christ. It's talking about pictures of heavenly and eternal realities. Uh, the tabernacle was an earthly copy of a heavenly reality and temple. Um, and the tabernacle was bringing into this world something that had a greater reality in heaven. And it was pointing forward to a greater reality to come. So here's, here's another illustration. Um, 
So you have a heavenly reality, and then you have uh, a shadow of that reality coming down in the Old Testament. And then you have the actual reality coming down in the New Testament. And the, the shadow is picturing both the reality in heaven and the reality that's coming down in the future. Does that make sense? Um, without getting into pictures of Christ, can you think of any other shadows in the Old Testament that prefigure later realities? Matt. I think the first thing that I thought of with reality coming down, and I'll work backward, is the heavenly Jerusalem coming out of, from heaven down to earth in Revelation, and also to a certain extent in the, the Old Testament prophets, but there was a real Jerusalem, like a, a physical Jerusalem. Um, then you had these prophecies of like, kind of a, like an Ezekiel, I guess, of this new temple and new city and all this kind of stuff. But it wasn't quite, like, there were things about it that weren't quite, that went beyond um, material reality. And then finally you get the new Jerusalem that is physically impossible, uh, but is, re is even more real, and it's coming from yeah. down to earth. But there's a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, um, and it's more real. You know, it's... It, if any of you ever read like the Chronicles of Narnia, this is kind of what, what C.S. Lewis was trying to describe in the last battle when they enter into the, the new Narnia. And, it, and they enter in, they think, you know, the old Narnia passed away. Well, where are we now? Well, the more we look, we realize this is actually Narnia, but it's actually more real, more real and better and bigger and more fulfilling. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, the, the tabernacle and temple, the, 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 the art in the tabernacle and temple was all garden imagery. And it was this picture of that God is trying to bring a shadow back into this world of us dwelling with him and us having access to him. Jerry? Well, I was thinking of the ark of the covenant. You know, okay. The walls inside the ark, and then ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilling the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you, when you said ark, I thought of another ark. Um, first, first Peter 3, 20 says that baptism corresponds to Noah's flood. The word, the word corresponds in first Peter 3, 20 is the word antitupos, antitype. Um, so that, that Noah bringing his family through the, the, the waters of judgment was a shadow pointing forward towards a, a greater reality to come, which is baptism into Christ. Um, or, you know, you, you could also think of the Levitical baptism and the, the baptism of the priests in the Old Testament is a prefiguring, a shadow of a, of a greater priestly baptism to come. You could think of the, the Passover meal which was, you know, or the, the sacrificial meal, the meal at the end of the sacrificial system, prefigures the Lord's Supper and then the wedding supper of the Lamb. Okay, so, the, so types, typology is, is not just types of Christ, they're, they're types of heavenly things that God is bringing into greater and greater reality uh, and promises which will bring to to completion. I saw another hand up. Yeah, Robin. I was going to say the, uh, the, part, the lamb without spot that were taken in sacrifice. And so when Christ came, it says the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yeah, well, now you're getting into types of Christ. Yeah. Um, what, what do you mean? Like 
I mean, that, that, that's, that's typology, but it's, it's types of Christ. Okay. Yeah, this is where we're, where we're going this morning. Yeah. You, you have 12 tribes named after 12 patriarchs. In the New Testament, Jesus points 12 apostles. The na- on the names of the stones of the new heavenly Jerusalem are the names of the 12, 12 apostles. So there, there, there's, a, there's these connections that, that God is showing all the way through. All right, so here's, here's the question. Where should we look for shadows and pictures, particularly of Christ. We're looking for Christ in the Old Testament. What kinds of pictures of Christ are there? And, and remember, going back to something, uh, right, an answer to Robin, what's the difference between this and an allegory? Well, an allegory can, is fiction, ultimately. A type, David Murray says, a type is always some, a real someone or something um, that is picturing and pointing forward to something greater still to come. So what kinds of pictures of Christ are there? I'm looking for categories. There. You mean like people? People. Things like the cleft in the rock. And okay. Places. Objects, animals. Okay, animals. Are there? There are uh, now. I, I mean, I, I, we're going to see, like, yeah, in the sense of like the, the the Passover lamb or the lamb, you know, the uh, the state the scapegoat. Um, but there, those are I'm going to describe as more events. Now there are. Images, there are illustrations God used, like the, the Lion of Judah is an illustration. Um, I don't know if it's, those, you'd quite think of those as types. Um, so David Murray says that there are, it identifies five categories of types. Person, place, object, event, or office. Um, I would actually add one more. I'm not gonna, we're not going to have time to talk about it this morning, but, I, but covenant. Uh, I think the covenants of old, the Old Testament are, are typological. Um, but I want us to talk through these varieties of types. Um, let's begin with person. What persons are types of Christ? And, and what you have to think is, the Bible explicitly tells us some persons that are types of Christ. The Bible doesn't specifically say that say others that I think are still types. Meaning, we can look at the ones the Bible explicitly identifies as types and use the, the, the things you realize there to look for other persons that I think are types of Christ. Um, so for instance, in, in Romans 5, Paul explicitly says Adam was a type of the one who was to come. So he uses the word. So Adam is a type of Christ. Um, how, how is Adam a type of Christ? Kira. He represented many. He, he represented, it represented many. He, he's the representative man. He's the federal head the head of his family, um, the things he was asked to do were pictures of what Christ would be asked to do in a far greater and more meaningful way. Um, Hebrews 12 compares the sacrifice of Abel to the sacrifice of Jesus, which it says is better so there's this comparison. Abel was a, was a type of Christ. Um, unjustly put to death. His, his sacrifice, uh, his blood, 
is better than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood calls out for judgment. Christ's blood calls out for justification. Um, both were put to death for righteousness. All right, what, who are some other people who are types? Gina. Hebrews talks about Moses being the keeper of God's house. Okay. Um, just as, as Moses was the, a servant in God's house, Jesus is a son over the house. You know, we could, we could go a lot into Moses. Um, he was the baby rescued from those who would destroy him. The prince of Egypt sent away into the wilderness, then the lowly shepherd who God would call to bring his people out of slavery. It's, it's like the whole of Moses' life from his, you know, having to be, you know, put into the basket and rescued from, the, the, from Pharaoh to him being sent away into the wilderness is a picture of something to come. Um, what, about Mo, what about Noah? What about Noah's life pictures Christ? Matt. I think um, the warnings that he preached while he was building, in essence, the temple, the ark, the, you know, and this is the only way, the only way judgment is coming, and he's building that and preparing it, and um, then judgment comes, and salvation is only found in that ark slash temple that he built. Okay. So Noah is described as a righteous man. Uh, grieved at the world around him, God appoints him to build an ark and to rescue all whom God draws to him from, from the judgment that's coming. And so Noah provides for it. Mary Jo. Um, King David, he was a shepherd of the sheep of the Lord. Okay. So David was another you know, person you could say is a big picture he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was the one nobody would have chosen. You know, Sa Samuel comes, God you know, comes to Jesse's house, sees the oldest brother, and says, surely this is the one God has chosen. Goes through all the brothers, and God hasn't chosen any of these. Is there anybody else? Well, we wouldn't think you would want to see our youngest, David. Um, but he's the one that God chooses. He's the one that God, he's the one rejected by Saul, persecuted, suffering, um, and yet he's the one that God gives, gives victory. Uh, a lot of hands. Tiffany. This leads over into office, but Melchizedek is the priest of the king. Okay. Yeah, Mel Melchizedek, um, this guy who blesses <coughs> Abraham without father or mother, you know, Hebrew says, yeah, that starts to get into a little bit of, of office. Um, how about Isaac? Or the story of Abraham and Isaac? How is that a type? Well, it's representing him not withholding his son. Okay. Right? Offering him the sacrifice the way Jesus was. E even before the sacrifice of Isaac, you have... Isaac is the supernatural birth. You know, the one who, you're barren. You can't give birth. You shouldn't be able to give birth. Uh, you try to get birth in you know, another way, and that, that God doesn't want that. God says, that, you know, it's going to be what I do supernaturally to bring about yourself, you know, your, the fulfillment of my promises. There's actually this whole theme of barrenness in the Old Testament and God overcoming barrenness that becomes typological. Um, and, so, and so Isaac comes and Isaac is the supernatural son. And yet he's the supernatural son that the father has to be willing to give up. Um, yeah, and then God will show that he's gonna provide the, the lamb. And so there's a, there's a type of the father and the son there. Um, what about the story of Joseph? Now here's, Joseph is not one explicitly mentioned in the New Testament as a type. 
If he's not explicitly mentioned, does that mean he's not a type? Okay, when you think about the story of Joseph, it's all typological. How, how, is, how is the story of Joseph a type of Christ? Jerry. He was forsaken by his brethren and then elevated to stardom. Yeah, he's the favored son of the father rejected by his brothers, sold into slavery, going down into prison, left for dead, um, and then raised to be the highest of Egypt, the one who's going to intercede and save the very brothers who rejected him from starvation and famine and death and, and provide for them and bless the whole earth in the process. Jan. Also forgives his brothers. Also forgives his brothers. When they come, and they, you know, he's in tears that he can help his brothers after all that they did him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how do you get a bigger picture? Like the whole of Christ's life in some sense. You know, the favored son taking the lowest place, being raised to the highest place. Matt. Yeah, so part of what God does with Jesus' life by sending him down to Egypt is capturing something that God has been saying all along. Sending Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days is capturing something that God has been saying all along. Um, okay, we could say a lot more Let's, let's go on to talk about place. What places can you think are, that are pictures or types of Christ? I've already mentioned some this morning. Matt, or uh, Mary. <laughs> We're one, go ahead. The ark, Noah's ark. Okay. It's a hiding, it's a place where God himself shut his people in to rescue them from the wrath of wrath against Good. Yeah, we are, we've already mentioned the tabernacle, the temple, the place where God dwells with his people and atones for their sins. And, and you can meet with God, uh, in a sense. God's presence with us. And, and, and Jesus says, you know, tear down this temple in three, build, three days I will rebuild it. I, I am the... The temple. I don't know if this is to be considered, but I was going with the burning bush. Okay. And the fact that God was in the bush, yet it was not consumed. And yet, here we are as that bush yeah. dwells in us. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't know if it's, if it's I know, I th a category or not. No, I think, I think it fits. Um, you know, I think another one, you know, uh, Bethel, um, where Joseph, not Joseph, where Jacob uh, first, you know, run, runs from Esau, and lays his head on the rock and has a dream of, of God coming down this, this steps and the angels of God descending and ascending on these steps. Jesus says in John chapter 1 to... Uh, I forget who it was, Philip or somebody, you know, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, meaning I'm the new Bethel, house of God. Um, what about object? Or Sarah, go ahead. I was going to say Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And also the promised land, two places that are okay. sort of prominent and representative of heaven or the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. Let's go on to, to uh, object. And, and some of these blur into one another. So we've already mentioned like the, the ark in some sense. Can you think of any other objects? Yeah, Brie. Um, I was thinking of the, 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 the,
All right, the serpent raised up on the, on the stick. Um, a lot of things in the wilderness. Can you think of some other objects in the wilderness? Um, this is sort of half place, half object. There's a lot about wells. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the living water that Jesus gives. I was thinking of the manna in the wilderness. Jesus says, I am the bread from heaven uh, that comes down. Um, the showbread of the tabernacle, the bread, it's called the bread of God's presence. Um, the lamps of the tabernacle show, show the light of God's presence, the rock in the wilderness, this goes into the well issue, you know, the rock in the wilderness that gets struck and gives water. Um, you could say the sword of judgment. Uh, this is a theme of, of sword that runs through the Old Testament that will eventually be turned against the man of God's right hand to bring us back into access to the tree of life because there's a sword fiery sword blocking the way. Um, Chris, do you have your hand up? I was thinking uh, of fire. The pillar of cloud and fire. Um, there's a, you could say, a typology of uh, Pentecost, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, tongues of fire coming down on the believers at Pentecost. Um, and again, we're already blurring some of these, but what about event? Passover. The Passover lamb, the blood over the doorpost that will save the, you know, the firstborn. Um, the, the exodus itself, the whole event of the exodus, bringing people out of slavery in Egypt. You know, the prophets, the, the later prophets, talk about <clears throat> the work of the Messiah as bringing a greater exodus. We, we need a deeper rescue from slavery that, that, that has to happen. Um, the, the sacrificial system is an event, the sacrifices. Um, you could even look at David and Goliath, and there's a typology to, uh, to that. Um, the I, I want us to move forward because we've got a couple more things to talk about. The last one is a big one. That's the offices. What offices do you see in the Old Testament that Christ came to fulfill? <clears throat> what are the three main offices, Matt? Priests, Priests prophets, prophets, kings. Um, what did they all have in common? Priests, prophets, kings. How did they come into their office? They had to, be, had to be called. They also had to be anointed. What is the word anointed in Hebrew? Anybody know? The word anointed is the word messiah. It's where we get our word messiah. The messiah is the anointed one. Um, so, and there were clear promises in the Old Testament that God was going to send a greater prophet, a greater priest, a greater king still to come. Actually, the Jews uh, debated about whether that meant there were going to be multiple messiahs coming, a prophetic messiah and a priestly messiah and a kingly messiah. Um, and so, whenever you see someone in the Old Testament Faithfully fulfilling one of those offices, you can say they become a type of Christ. Um, and, and going back to person, the first category there, realistically, the persons who are types of Christ are so because of the offices they are fulfilling. Um, you know, even Joseph was a prophet, right? God gave him prophetic... Uh, you know, pro prophecies. That, and he, he fulfills an office, a mediatorial office for God's people. And so the, 
for the mediators of the Old Testament who fulfill a mediatorial office representing God's rule, representing God's word, representing God's mercy and grace are, are always going to be types, pictures of Christ to come. Um, great. Now let me, let me go back to the illustrations I used earlier. Um, this one is this idea of this heavenly reality and a shadow coming down and then a greater fulfillment still to come. This graphic is actually a different version and contained in this graphic. You, you, you split that rectangle into the upper half triangle and that is very, very similar to, to what's going on here. Um, and, I, and I point that out because what I think both of these are saying is again, there has to be an understandable relationship between the type and the anti-type. Between a message that could be originally understood and a message that was gonna be greater still to come. And, and the idea of interpretation is you can't, you have to follow the connections. You can't skip the line. Um, typology isn't arbitrary. It's, it's not hunting for, for, for secret things. Um, you, there, there had to be an original meaning and a later meaning that grows out of the original meaning. And so I want to I want to end with some uh, by giving some principles of typology. Um, and the, the first is the type, the shadow, had an original meaning that finds greater fulfillment in the future. And and the point is that the, each of the types had an original relevance to Old Testament believers. There was something it meant for them, even if not fully understood. When, when, they, when they approached the tabernacle, there was something they could understand about why they needed a tabernacle and what was going on at the tabernacle. And that thing, that deeper thing that they were meant to understand was... was uh, the, the thing that would have, have relevance later. So it has an original meaning, and then there must be an organic connection between the original meaning and the future fulfillment. Uh, there's a progressive fulfillment that grows out of the original revelation. You have to be able to see how it grows out. And yet, the types were necessarily temporary and inadequate. That's a huge point. Um, something in the original was originally revealed as inadequate and ultimately needing something more. So that when they approached the tabernacle or the temple, they, they knew something of the meaning of why this was here. And yet you see these glimpses throughout the Old Testament that they realize I actually need something more, not just the pictures. I need the reality of these things. Um, and so that leads into the true power of the type is ultimately found only in its fulfillment. And true Old Testament believers were seeing the deeper significance. Meaning, we, we know that there were real believers and false believers in the Old Testament. And the Bible implies that even in the Old Testament, the real believers were, were seeing, maybe not fully, but what they were trusting was this deeper significance that they were learning from the type. Um, well, in that sense, then the type still helps us today understand the anti-type. Something about the shadows helps us understand the realities. This is why we go back to the Old Testament. And we say, there's something about this historical illustration that God has provided. 
of Joseph that helps us understand aspects of Christ. There, there's something about the sacrificial system that helps us understand Christ. There's something about the story of David that gives us a, a picture of, of Christ so that, that the type um, helps us see things that, that we need. Yeah, uh, Jim. Just to apply that uh, to a kind of ongoing unfolding. So when uh, the Israelites are in the desert, the wilderness, dry and even death all around them, uh, then, but there's the tabernacle. Uh, and so they enter into that. And of course, they get closer to God. But they are also probably thinking, since of course they're in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, that the tabernacle is a kind of foreshadowing of the promised land that they're going to be given. Mm -hmm. So then finally they enter into the promised land. Well, it's uh, better than the wilderness, but there's still a lot of problems in it. But then they uh, get rid of the temple. Now we have the temple in the middle of the promised land that does have these problems. Just like we earlier had the tabernacle that was in the wilderness that had a lot of problems. But, so now we finally have our temple. We've got this wonderful kingdom under, under David, David and, well, by, of course, under Solomon uh, by the time the temple was built. But then something is going wrong. Uh, so that even the temple in the promised land isn't really heaven on earth, so to speak. Yeah. And, but all, all of it is suggesting, well, this is a foreshadowing. You're, getting, you're being revealed more and more of the nature of the ultimate promised land, which would in a way be the new Jerusalem in which God will be present mm. there before you. Mm. I think there are two really good examples of the very end of that, which are Simeon and these are people who spend all their lives in that temple. And they, you know, to quote the song, they still hadn't found what they were looking for. They were still, <laughs> they, they were praying, they were serving, they were doing all of this. And then one day Christ comes back, in a sense, into the temple. And that they both realize that this is it. They have finally found it. And I think that gets to what Jim was saying, is that for, you know, a thousand years or more, these folks had had this temple. You know, going back even further, they'd had the tabernacle. And it just wasn't, it, it, the real Old Testament believers understood it wasn't it. They, had, they hadn't found it yet until Simeon and Anna again, they see Christ coming in. And that's like, okay, this is it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, As a picture of, of, of Christ. I, I think what the Bible implies is that real believers in the Old Testament, who were in the Old Testament, saw something of that deeper significance. That's what they were, were trusting. Now, could they completely connect the dots? Probably not. Um, but they knew if it's, if it's on me, <laughs> We're not gonna cut it. You know, God has to provide the ram, the, the ram or the lamb. And ultimately, the blood of bulls, bulls and goats, you know, the, those, those don't really cut it. They know they need a Messiah to come. You know, what that, how that Messiah was gonna fully do it, they may not have known, but they knew that, that the fact that I gotta keep going through these sacrifices, I know I need God to provide for them, but I need something permanent. I need something better. I need something that reaches down inside of me. You know, even John the Baptist came and says, I baptize you with water. Um, but he who comes after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, where they, it won't just be an outward symbol, it'll be an inward reality in the heart. Um, so, I th and I think that, you know, John the Baptist is that guy who kind of you know, straddles the, the testaments, who, who's kind of that guy who says, I'm the guy preparing the way. That's what all these types were doing. They were preparing the way. 
And yet, you don't just need the picture, you need, you need the reality. Um, okay, well, we need to, we need to end there. Um, next week, we start talking about Christ as actually present in the Old Testament. And that's where we'll, where we'll spend the rest of, of our time. Um, you know, so th- this gives you a foundation. Uh, I think the, wh- one of the coolest things is to realize um, all these things are there, but Christ is actually there and is doing things in the Old Testament. And he actually is meant, to, it's meant for us to see the ways that he's there. All right, let me close this in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we, we thank you that uh, you have um, revealed yourself in ways that we need, in ways that we can understand, and that you, for your purposes to, um, to make yourself known, have worked out this revelation in history. You gave shadows, but you have given us the reality coming down. Um, and, and a promise that, that one day the heavens themselves will come down. Um, and that has been sealed to us by the work of your son Jesus. We thank you for that and we pray that we would, we would grow in our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen.